Welcome to the Digi Barn. Uh, two years ago, roughly, uh, Alan and I went to the Computer History Museum, or then the Computer History Center at uh, Ames Research Center at Moffitt, and we met John Tool, and we were really excited about his collection, and this collection of the Computer Museum History Center. I remember commenting to John that, um, hey, why don't we, is it possible that we could do something to uh, bring some of the machines to life or to focus on the software and the interactive experience. And uh, John said, gee, that's a good idea. Um, well, why don't you do something about that? You know, stay in touch with us. Why, why don't you go and look and at that? And then, of course, you get more more contemporary. I mean, you, you see that's what the DigiBarn is all about. I mean, you can see how how Apple and kind of the evolution of Apple and some of the Xerox Star or look at Xerox Park and some of the things that worked and didn't work. Okay. <laughs> John, uh, here it is, uh, the DigiBarn Computer Museum. Starting from small beginnings here in our barn in the Santa Cruz Mountains, uh, we started uh, collecting computers and getting donations and buying them on eBay and uh, getting a lot of visitors and it filled up the upstairs three rooms and then we decided, well, let's, let's have an opening and uh, let's invite the Computer History Museum people and a lot of other people from the industry. So we built it out to expand and fill the entire barn. So let's get started. Uh, first off, let's get you signed into our registry, get you a name tag and your donation to to Piglet, Theo, or Mama, the three pigs that live here in the barn, get you signed in, and then we'll move on to boot up. This is my favorite room because this is the room in which you get to do the whole timeline through this period from the from 1975, from home brewing, the personal computer, and here we have our amidst Altair 800B system and. A lot of great stuff, some great original Altair notes, an MSI 8080 from the Exploratorium, uh, Peter Jennings' original uh, MOS technology, Kim 1, that was used to program micro chess, and gee, it goes on all the way up here. Beautiful, beautiful Sol 20, Lee Felsenstein and Company built, the Commodore PET 2001 series. We have a wonderful TRS 80 Model 1 with the stringy floppy drive which really was just a tape drive. And then on through the Apple revolution, uh, this very interesting piece here the, uh, that Microsoft Museum is now looking into, uh, which may be one of the first Microsoft basics sent from Microsoft in Albuquerque to Apple. Sort of a really historic thing. On through Apple, here we have our Lisa in the process of trying to boot up and uh, showing the birth of the graphical interface on through the CPM world to um, this interesting comparison here, the grid compass the same year as the Osborne 1, incredibly different technology and here we have the Osborne uh, running word star on a 5 inch screen over to our right they have the great event of 1984 the shipping Macintosh, the very very first Shipping Max, First Byte Magazines, and the rest of the room here we've got um, the beginnings of the end for a lot of these systems, the IBM Personal Computer 5150, which really ended the CPM era, and then on through the 80s into the next cube at the end of the 80s. On the other part of the major lineages we have, to our right, we have Xerox world, a completely different world that existed from the mid 70s from Park on, a world of network documents and visual interfaces and mice and network systems that existed prior to the web and prior to the rest of us having this. And we've created a complete Xerox network here to run an application such as Maze War and bring a lot of things back to life. Here we have the original. Uh, Xerox Star system from 81 and uh, some really, really early artifacts. Uh, we have a Xerox Dolphin here, the first of the D machines, and we have a Max C here, a piece of the Max 
mainframe and the a prototype of the last D machine from uh, Xerox Park. Here's a special table that we put out that relates three different artifacts. The first is the Altair 8800, the first widely used kit computer which is programmed by switches on the front panel. We have Rich Today's Finite State Fantasies which is a, a cartoon book that was produced in the summer of 75 and it's all about the nascent computer culture of kit makers and it's about people building alternate realities and real vision for what was going to happen in personal computing. We have Ted Nelson's Computer Lab signed uh, for us by Ted. This was published even before um, the birth of the personal computer. Here's the biggie, big mainframes. And it's also kind of a cartoonic, sort of a cartoonic polemic about the culture that would arise in the, the era that we're looking at, 1975 up. And Ted's actually given us permission to scan this and put this on the site as research. And lastly, we have a decade of research, Palo Alto Research Center, that was given to me by John Seely Brown. And it contains all the original papers from the, the decade uh, up, uh, the, of Park, which really was somewhat disconnected from this, but it was a parallel track that led innovation. We're now going up to the Cambrian explosion of personal computing, and as we go, we see that uh, the walls are coated with t-shirts that we've chosen from our 3,000 uh, t-shirt collection that give a really nice effect uh, and surround you with the ultimate symbol of uh, the geek culture, the t-shirt. And here we are in playing around at home, uh, which is a gallery devoted to the home computer. And here, here are two uh, networked uh, Vectrexes. These are actual vector-based game systems uh, from the very early 80s. And you don't see very many vector-based systems. Um, and these were fa very sort of fascinating, very cheap game consoles. And over here we have the great peanut butter keyboard at Atari 400 that. The, the, the tank, the venerable tank of home arcades, just indestructible, probably will run in a hundred years, uh, playing popular games like Space Invaders. And over here we have the updated uh, Pong in color from 1976, the two-player Pong, which I'm terrible at. Oh, I lost. And several other systems. And jumping, jumping forward into the late 1990s, the Audrey, because computer history is not just about 20 years ago, it's about today. The Audrey was a project at 3Com to make a kind of a kitchen computer that anyone would use, surfing the web, uh, just a beautiful interface, little keyboard. People wonder where, what happened to the Audrey, and well, it's here in the museum, but for consideration of uh, what happens to innovation in the business process. Here it is, the Audrey. And now we have the 80s beige invasion. Boring beige business boxes of all kinds as the personal computer started to become a commodity. The Sanyo PC. Of course it would Sanyo would make a PC that looks like a VCR. And here we have operating system wars, applications and operating systems. So we have on this side, we have the Windows world, the Microsoft world, and we have on this side everybody else. So it kind of shows you the back and forth of what was going on. Of course people don't realize that many of the applications, say for the Macintosh, uh, were written by Microsoft. And um, here are some of the comparisons that Apple would do, uh, fighting the tide of the, the growing dominance of the PC. So here in this one exhibit is sort of embodied the process and the excitement of the time in the 80s when this great competition was, was occurring. And down here we have something pretty special. We have original Microsoft mouse and we have uh, a running, we've got ourselves a running version of uh, Windows 1.0 coming on up 1985-86 there it is 
windows. And here's uh, back in the mid 80s, a system that I wrote about the time that uh, Windows 1.0 was coming out. I was uh, coding a desktop operating system uh, for a small company named Elixir, and we were marketed by Xerox. So here it is running on a on a 10 year old, 15 year old PC, and there's my desktop that I wrote uh, based on the star uh, metaphor. So this is what actually got me excited about uh, all this stuff, uh, interfaces and their evolution and the m machines that ran them. Portable systems like the Exo Terminal, the, all the various variants of, of portability in, in computers on the move. One of my favorites is, uh, is here, the Context 10 from 1969, a portable personal calculator. At last, a portable computer for executives, the Bohm context. And here we have uh, the man on the train with his Bohm personal, uh, well, called a portable computer. You could try it for two weeks free. A mathematical giant for two weeks free. General Magic. Magic app. And here we have Steve Jobs Next. Uh, in fact, one of the last models of the Next, the Next, the Color Next Slab. Just a beautiful system, beautifully designed, and you know, just common sense. Beautiful gold connectors, and when you want to turn it off, you just hit power off, and it says power off, and you say turn it off. No mess, no fuss. So here we are back in another world uh, in PFS Write on an Apple IIe. Uh, really, really limited, simple word processor, but hey, when all you had was a, an impact printer, uh, now we'll go down to the Macintosh way. Well, welcome to Family Macintosh, or we, as we call it here at the DigiBarn, the Cult of Mac. And one of the most famous Macs that uh, is here at the DigiBarn is the Black Mac, the 1891T. The uh, machine that was given to us that uh, got us all, all over the web, uh, on Wired, and it's a tempested Macintosh. And the company that made it sent us another one. They sent us a Mac Plus from Canvas Systems. A yeah, battle-hardened Macintosh for uh, use in on Navy battleships. Welcome to Family Macintosh, starting from our first little baby Mac, going all the way up through the major lineages of the Mac, up to our only Power Mac, uh, crossing through the uh, rare and unusual Macintosh TV, designed for college dorms and not really sold, all the way up to the first Power Macintosh. And here we have the largest member of the DigiBarn collection, uh, at weighing several tons, the uh, Cray One system from Lawrence Berkeley Labs that, that you're familiar with that came by a Tony Cole. And it's Cray number 34. And we think there's about eight of these in the world. And here's a, a board from the populated column here on my left. And we can see where the numbers come in and where the, the math is done and where they come out. It's a vector processor, nice solid, heavy uh, copper backing on this uh, for heat dissipation out through the fluorinert going up and down the, uh, the columns. And the Cray was built so you could sit on it and you could service it. So these are actually seats. People think this is just a big love seat and, uh, well, it, it really could be. And we set up the uh, Cray from Lawrence Berkeley Labs to allow people to get right up inside it and just kind of feel how it's made and how the, the ladies that wired these uh, must have, the challenge that they had in manufacturing these, and give people a real personal touch uh, with this, which is uh, like a piece of art, in fact. The whole focus here at the DigiBarn is to touch it, get an impression of it, tell your story about it, really get a relationship with it. 
One of the uh, special contributors to the Digi Barn is Daniel Kotke, who uh, worked in the garage with Wozniak and Jobs, uh, wiring together Apple One, soldering together Apple One boards. And one of the things that he's brought by for display here is something he built in 7980. It's a portable music computer uh, built out of some very odd components, built on an old Apple II board, keyboard, and one of the first monitors that Jeff Raskin bought uh, to design prototype Macintoshes in 79. Also, what Daniel's brought by for us, but this is the original chart, uh, the original diagram for the design of the entire Macintosh, uh, was, was called a 512K motherboard, logic board. Um, and this is the only existing reproduction of this D diagram of the Mac from Daniel. Speaking of uh, Jobs and Wozniak, this little exhibit here shows the culture of Apple, the two different cultures. The, the culture of Steve Jobs, which was to build a beautifully designed machine that was very closed. In fact, uh, the only way to open up an original Macintosh was this device, the Mac Cracker. It allowed you to crack open the case. And if you did that as an end customer, you avoided your warranty. And Steve was so so sure that he wanted a perfect quiet system that, that he ordered this uh, original first Mac not to have a fan because he wanted something that, that wasn't clunky like old computers. So people uh, burned them up uh, because they tended to need a fan. So one company invented the Mac chimney that you could simply put on here and, and it would create a chimney effect and draw the heat off. Over here we have Wozniak's last design for Apple, the Apple 2GS, and this is actually a Woz limited ed edition 2GS, and it's just a beautiful, simple design. It's very open, it's very extensible. Roughly at the same time as the Mac was getting going, this was getting going, and this culture lost out ultimately at Apple, and you ended up with a culture much more in the uh, image of Steve Jobs. Here we have some Apple wannabes. Here's an original B box uh, running the B operating system, uh, which didn't have a long life. It's just been liquidated as a company. It's an interesting history. Here we have uh, the Dynamac. A company in Colorado built the first portable Macintosh. In fact, this is a Dynamac used by Apple to uh, move around and, and do uh, network and system operations and it prompted Apple to finally build a portable Macintosh. So here we have uh, Galen's tchotchke wall. This is Galen's uh, art direction here and all the different tchotchkes and books and, and things that have gone along with the, the PC uh, and network culture, digital culture over the last 25 years. And one thing that's very rare and very odd is the uh, the smack a mac uh, something that was uh, made for Macintosh. And I, don't, I don't know why, but you just like, just so you could give it a smack. And there it is, the smack a mac There's a whole story behind this. Well, thank you for joining us here for the quick tour of the DigiBarn Computer Museum up high above Silicon Valley in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And uh, we're just going to close up the barn now and uh, hope you'll come back join us sometime soon.